to Eschatology Matters. I'm your host, Josh Howard, and I'm joined today by Miles Christian from the YouTube channel Answering Adventism. So, Miles, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Miles, I'm just reading from your uh, from your YouTube profile. Um, we came across you through a, a mutual friend, uh, Jeremiah, over at Apologetic Dog. But um, you you describe yourself on here as a third generation former Seventh Day Adventist. And you even have an affirmation of the uh, the creeds, the apostles, Athanasian, and Nicene creeds on your YouTube channel there. Um, tell me a little bit about that. How'd your ministry get started? And, and what was the impetus behind you jumping into uh, apologetics work specifically with Adventism? Um, well, well, I guess first I should say thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, the bug came to start answering Adventism some years ago. Now, at the time, I didn't know uh, what exactly that was going to look like, what sort of skin that was going to take a YouTube channel, that type of stuff. Um, I just had a burden to reach Seventh-day Adventists. Um, that came from being raised Seventh-day Adventist, um, to eventually be led to a point of realizing that I didn't know the gospel. What I believed to be the gospel was actually not the gospel. Um, and the God that I was taught to believe wasn't real. Mm. He's a different, he's a false Christ. And that really hit me. Um, very hard when I had a friend who shared the gospel with me for really the first time. And after that experience, I uh, had a radical conversion. And through that experience, had a new hunger for the word of God. Um, I'm really compressing things down here, but sure, yeah. um, and, and through that development for a love of the word of God, um, a growing love for the body of Christ, um, these sorts of things. Um, I quickly started to realize that most definitely what I was taught growing up does not actually align with the Bible if you remove a lot of the extra baggage that that tradition is bringing to the biblical text. Okay. And so as I started to grow in my in my faith and my understanding, I had a burden. I didn't feel equipped as a babe in Christ <laughs> to be engaging apologetically, at least in the, the the regard that I am right now. I was doing a lot of that on the ground. I actually went to an Adventist university post being born again. Oh, wow. um, so I was not an Adventist while I was there. I kind of saw it as like um, getting my education, but also being a missionary in this closed shoebox of the universe. Mm. Um, and so being able to enter in there and having this hunger for the word of God now and really studying theology, parsing apart where the issues are, um, the definitions, the differences in those areas, and starting to really have these discussions on the ground with um, Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, religion professors, students, pastors, laity, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and through all that, I have read thousands of pages of their pioneers. Um, I've studied the system um, in its systematic representation, yeah. um, if you will, and have compared that with other theological systems, that sort of stuff. And so after years and years of doing that, um, the idea of a YouTube channel kind of arose. I wasn't really uh, camera savvy or uh, not even really comfortable recording myself for that regard. Um, <laughs> but I thought, you know, YouTube channel could be a great way. And so the Lord has just kind of led in that to, uh, where I'm at now. YouTube. It's funny. You mentioned the YouTube thing because th there, there's a lot of us who are playing catch up as far as technology goes, but, um, this is where people can engage the content. And, and you and I were talking, you know, about that before the show, how you have a lot of content on your channel. Um, and that's that's in a medium and in a space where a lot of people can access it that probably, you know, wouldn't have years ago. So it's kind of kind of one of those necessary things. But I want you to kind of walk us into a little bit because we'll steer it toward eschatology in a minute. Um, but when you were talking about Adventism, uh, you didn't describe it as a different denomination. You described this as something outside the pale of Christian orthodoxy. And without, you know, obviously it would probably take a while to walk through all those distinctives and people can probably oh, go yeah. to the channel where you do some of that. But like, what are some of the big broad brush strokes here where you would say, no, 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 this isn't just like a different denomination. This is something that's significantly a departure. Um, for many yeah. of us, you might be familiar you know, in passing, people may have seen Ellen G. White's writings. People may have seen um, maybe, uh, you know, pictures of Kellogg in the sanitarium, stuff like that, sanatorium, sanitarium. Um, so so there may be like a vague uh, understanding, but just like what are some of those big broad brushstrokes theological categories you're speaking about? Yeah, so um, the thing that my flag is really planted in, um, and this is not just with Seventh-day Adventism, this is with the Christian faith, is our cardinal central doctrines, um, Christology, the gospel who is God, um, these sorts of things. And when it comes to Adventism, um, they have a different gospel and they have a different God. 
um, which also then begets a false Christ. Mm. And the details, the details matter. It's more than just they're going to use the the name Jesus, of course, um, but all Christological heretics were claiming to believe in Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim to believe in a Jesus. The Muslims claim to believe in a Jesus. Um, but all of these Jesuses contradict one another. So these details actually matter. And since Paul warns about false gospels and false Jesuses in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, um, that begs the question, there are false Christs. Mm -hmm. There are false Jesuses out there. And so the details do matter. And so that's going to be the, the two big ones. But then um, the third big one that, I know there's going to be a lot of Adventists out there that are mad about this, but um, my my position in my channel is always coming from the standpoint of the organization and its official stated beliefs. So I understand that there are Seventh-day Adventists out there that are going to disagree with this, but from the standpoint of the official stated beliefs of the organization, mm -hmm. Ellen White functions as an infallible interpreter over the scriptures. Okay. Um, now, I have the source documentation on that for the Adventists that want to say that's not true. Well, you have receipts. it is true. Good. It, it is true. And I, I've shown the receipts on the channel before, so people can check that sort of stuff out on my channel. There's lots of streams I've dedicated to, specifically Ellen White, and there'll be plenty more to come in the future where those same things will be brought out. Um, and so, yeah, she she functions as the infallible interpreter over top of the scriptures, and it comes in the form of what they call, which we're going to look at a little bit tonight, um, the great controversy theme. So there's more than just the book that a lot of people are familiar with that Ellen White wrote, which was the result of a supposed vision that she was given um, about this great controversy between Jesus and Satan. Mm. And so this is now what informs all of their theology. So it informs why Jesus came, who Jesus is, why sin entered the world, what justification, sanctification, obedience, the gospel, everything. It defines all of that. Okay. So just go ahead and start walking us into that, Miles, because because you're talking about the the great controversy. Um, I don't think one of the one of the reasons I was looking forward to this interview was um, I don't think I was going to have to steer the conversation toward eschatology. I think that's just going to naturally come out from your description of this, from what what you've been saying. But when we think of you know Christian the Christian faith in general, and especially within the reform streams, we would describe kind of an eschatological flow of scripture. A lot of people would would look to that theme, that fourfold theme of creation, um, fall, redemption, and then consummation, right? Like that kind of overarching flow of, of scripture. Um, walk us into then the great controversy and specifically how the SDAs would view kind of that overarching uh, view of, of the biblical storyline. So yeah, I'm going to share my screen here and walk you through what exactly this great controversy theme is. So this was written by a guy by the name of Herbert Douglas. He was, well, as you see here, he's the retired president at the Weimar Institute, which is a um, Within the Adventist world, it's a very prestigious Adventist institution. Um, and so this paper is from Ministry Magazine 2000. Ministry Magazine is what the Seventh-day Adventist Church sends out to their ministers or clergy. Um, and so this was from the December 2000 issue, and it was titled The Great Controversy Theme, What It Means to Adventists. So I'm going to read some of this here. Um, it's not super long, but I would like to get through all of it. We've looked at this on my channel before, um, but I think it will really give you the proper baseline and understanding when it comes to how uh, foundational it is to understand this, to understand the Seventh-day Adventist system and what they say when they say the words they do. So he says here, for Seventh-day Adventists, the GCT is the core concept that brings coherence to all biblical subjects. It transcends the age-old divisions that have fractured the Christian church for centuries. It brings peace to theological adversities who suddenly see, in a new harmony, the truths that each had been vigorously arguing for. Herein lies the uniqueness of Adventism. The uniqueness is not some particular element of its theology, such as its sanctuary doctrine. So that's the investigative judgment in the sanctuary, which is a novel doctrine to them, born out of the 1800s. Mm. However, he rightly recognizes and states here that that's not just what makes them unique. It's this great controversy theme. Rather, the distinctiveness of Adventism rests in its overall understanding of the central message of the Bible that is governed by its seminal governing principle, the great controversy theme. Every philosophical or theological system builds on a central governing theme or paradigm. Its central theme becomes that system's core truth and determines all of that system's principles and policies. 
Then he gives an example here of Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, the remarkable Cambridge physicist, wrote in his 1988 book, A Brief History of Time, that should, science, should scientists discover the long-sought theory of everything to explain the varying mechanisms of the universe, we should know the mind of God. Seventh-day Adventists have been given that. Notice, they've been given this. Hmm. A perspective which provides a theory of everything. It introduces us to the mind of God. We didn't discover it. It was given to us. We call it the great controversy theme. How we understand this core theme directly affects how we grasp the intent of biblical writers when they used words such as righteousness, salvation, gospel, etc., the Great Controversy theme helps us work our way through centuries of theological confusion over the meaning of such realities as justification, sanctification, atonement, obedience, and works. Without the Great Controversy theme, all would remain divided over such subjects as the importance of the Old Testament sanctuary service and the New Testament view of Christ as our high priest and mediator, the meaning of faith and grace, the place of obedience in relation to legalism, why Jesus came the first time, why he came the way he did, and when he will return. Hmm. So as you see here, the Adventist eschatological framework sets us apart from every other denomination that speaks of the end of the world because it is governed by the great controversy theme. The distinctly Adventist, or uh, yeah, the distinctly Adventist view is formed by a mutually supportive cluster of ideas. This is a very in a uh, key word to understand when listening to Adventists speak, this phrase, mutually supportive cluster. We're going to get into some of those, Josh. Sure. Yep. Including conditional immortality, Seventh-day Sabbatarianism, a premillennial historicist eschatology, acceptance of the gift of prophecy in the ministry of Ellen G. White, teaching about the priestly work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, and a prepared people by his grace. Another one of those buzzwords, a prepared people. That is a uh, sinless perfectionism. Okay. That's all. A people who have gotten to a point through the help of the Holy Spirit where they've had enough grace imparted to them to where they've now reached a sinlessly perfect state and they're prepared for the new earth and demonstrated that they will be fit to be let into the new earth, demonstrating that they won't let sin enter heaven again like Satan caused sin to enter heaven again. Okay. So all of that to say, this... Uh, Great controversy theme is central to the whole system. It informs everything. So it's not secondary. It's not, uh, well, some people are going to know about this. No, no, no. The system of Seventh day Adventist theology is predicated and built on this. So that begs the question of what exactly is the Great Controversy? Mm -hmm. The Great Controversy is a book written by Ellen White, which is the result of a supposed vision that she received from God. So when they say they were given this, that's who they were given this through, supposedly. It's coming from Ellen White, who was supposedly a continuation in the chain of prophets of old, now revealing what they would call present truth. It's further light and revelation for this present time. And it's coming through Ellen White. So their defense of the prophetic gifts and continuationism is another core aspect and component because without that, they're not going to be able to have the great controversy theme right, because it's right. essentially coming from Ellen White. So it is a book, but as you saw, it's also a theme. Well, in that book, Ellen White explains how this great controversy supposedly started and what exactly it is. It is the idea that in heaven, prior to the creation of earth, you have a huge, who, who knows, amount of time prior to the creation of the earth. So it's very similar to Mormonism in this regard. There's a pre-earth origin story. Okay. In this pre-earth origin story, the thing that started the controversy was the exaltation of Jesus to be made equal with the Father. He called together a heavenly throng of angels, the heavenly host of angels, to make this announcement. I'll actually uh, read you. Uh, a quote here so we can actually get the uh, the correct sources on this. 
So this was in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 17, which is a series of books as well. Ellen White was a very supposedly prolific author. She was also plagiarizing a lot, but nevertheless, um, thousands and thousands of pages. Miles, so this is from the series. For, just for a clarification, what time frame are we talking about here with Ellen G. White's writings? Well, they, they it's it spans. I don't know the exact date on the writing of the Spirit of Prophecy series. Okay. I can get that for you really quick if you want me uh, general, to. Uh, general, 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 general uh, broad brushstrokes, what like? It's it's it, uh you're talking uh eight late 1840s through all the way to 1910 okay very good thanks so this is not towards the end of her life though i i'm not going to guess on the on the date but it's it's going to be the 1800s portion gotcha. um this is spirit of prophecy volume 1 page 17 so the start of this book this is the very start um and she's talking about this event that starts this great controversy so she says quote The great creator, that's the father, assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself so that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence, Mm. end quote. Okay. Another quote, this is from one of her big three. So the big three are the great controversy, the uh, desire of ages, and patriarchs and prophets. Patriarchs and prophets, page 37. Because the defense they'll give to that first quote, Josh, is they're going to say, well, no, 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 no. In the next paragraph, she explicitly says, this wasn't a change in who Jesus is. It was merely a revelation of something that's always been the case. Okay. So, so, So remember that. Quote, patriarchs and prophets, page 37. The exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who, it was claimed, was also entitled to reverence and honor. Close quote. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 9. Quote, the Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. That's the Father. Mm. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen man. So this is after the fall. Satan causes Adam and Eve to sin. and They fall, and Satan rejoiced at this because he knew that now he that was his way of being able to now pull the son who was exalted down from his exalted status. Okay. So he was happy about that. And after this, the father essentially had what they would call a, or Ellen called like a council. And the son was able to be brought into this council to essentially talk about the plan of redemption for man. Mm. The son had to try and convince the father three times that he would be the one to come and ransom fallen man. Interesting. So yeah, that that's what she says. And so that's what's happening prior to what I'm about to read now. So after the, the fall of man and Jesus convinces the father after three times, the son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen man. He was of as much more value than man as his noble spotless character and exalted office as commander of all the heavenly host were above the work of man. He was in the express image of his father, not in features alone, but in perfection of character. So there's some interesting stuff there, too, that we could get into around the God of Adventism um, Mm. and the way they use words. They believe um, that they'll say they believe the Trinity. But what they actually believe is that God is three corporeal, physical, tangible forms, and being made in the image of God is your physical representation. Okay. And so when they use the term person, they use person and being interchangeably. And they'll say, yeah, we believe in three persons. But they're not meaning the ability to will, self-reflect, show emotion, speak, be spoken to, et cetera, which isn't necessarily contained to a physical uh, being. Right. Spiritual beings also have that ability. Um, So that's not something unique to having a physical form. But this then gets into their physicalism and the fact that they're monists. Um, So this is how you're seeing all this stuff is really interconnected through this great controversy theme. In order to make all this stuff work, that has to be what then informs the way that they define everything. One last one here is short. This is from just to show that this is a she, a consistent message that she was saying about the great controversy and how it started from various points in her life in various different writings. This is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 268. 
God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position, not a mere revelation of something that already took place or that was already the case from eternity past. Mm. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are open to his Son. So, Josh, this was also being written at a period of time where they did not believe that the Holy Spirit was even a person. Mm. They believed at that time that the Holy Spirit was merely the presence of the Father and the Son in their absence of being there. And it's still kind of how they they view the Holy Spirit today, many of them. It's that the, the Holy Spirit is how Jesus is omnipresent, for example. Okay. It's his presence while he's he's physically away from us. Yeah. Um, but this great controversy started by the exaltation of the Son to be made equal with the Father. Lucifer then saw this as an injustice and started to think, well, why was I not exalted? Aren't I beautiful? That's where they'll now start quoting things like Ezekiel um, and Lucifer falling from heaven. And it was because of his beauty and his pride. But there's this subtle slip in there that no, the, the fall of Lucifer in this system was actually started by the exaltation of the son to be made equal with the father. Mm. It wasn't just Lucifer being filled with pride, like the Bible says. Right. The pride was after the exaltation of the sun. That was the trigger. Interesting. It's really interesting on, on you describing this. Number one, I'm, I have a, about a thousand questions, but but it's it's a cosmology, right? Like, you, you know, you were mentioning the that clustering of, of teachings at the at the outset of this this recording. And yet now you're moving into it. And it's not just an eschatological forward looking thing. This is building like an entire cosmology outside. How prevalent is this? Is this just things that, for example, if you were um, deep into the writings of Ellen G. White and you're really studying these things, or is this pretty uh, lay level teaching within the SDA church? Like how prevalent is this very foreign to biblical material cosmology um, as far as like the rank and file SDA teachings? Well, so that's the thing is there is so much splintering in Adventism. They'll try and tell you that um, doctrinal division is the hallmark sign of apostate Protestantism. That's us, okay. by the way. Yeah. Um, which this then gets into that whole conversation, but um, that's supposed to be exclusive to us. And yet they're some of the most doctrinally divided people I've ever engaged with. And so it depends on the SDA you're talking about, but the great controversy is codified in their 28 fundamental beliefs. Okay. So they have a 28 fundamental beliefs. If you were baptized into the Adventist church, you have to say that you at least outwardly um, affirm those. And so it's codified in the the foundational fundamental beliefs. Um, but really, Josh, the way that it's going to be injected is, well, because when I was growing up, I didn't know these formal terms. That okay. paper we read by Herbert Douglas, your average laity in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not reading that paper. But the way that works is that paper is going out to the clergy, and the clergy are being taught from their seminaries, their universities, to be reading the Bible through the Great Controversy theme. Okay. Yeah. So whether they're using the technical terms or not, most Adventists that I, I engage with, they don't even see how they've been, how they're injecting these things into the scriptures because they're very good at, the Adventist church is very good at presenting this very polished package of mm. proof texts and claims. And the view is kind of, this is the principium of truth. We've arrived. We have the fullness of the truth. There's really nothing else to learn. Mm. Um, so it's just what you're told. Here's the proof text and responses. And it's just the trump card. Right. So they're very good at being able to memorize the system, memorize the talking points. I, I mean, I've been engaging SDAs at this level now for 10 years, and it's all the same verses. And this all goes back to the pioneers as well. And so all of that to say, um, the average person may not really understand the the mechanics behind all this and how it's informing everything. But if you start getting into discussion with them, you're 100% going to start to see the undertones of the great controversy coming through and how they view salvation, how they view Jesus, what his role was when he came here, um, who he is, mm. those types of things. Because um, the core central thing that's in focus typically with them right now is a part of their gospel message, which is the third angel's message. Um, they have a three angels messages gospel, uh, which I have done a series on my channel. If people want to check that out to get a 
pretty quick breakdown of, of that whole thing. Um, they call it the everlasting gospel. They've taken this phrase from Revelation 14, 6. And you'll notice in Revelation 14, at the beginning, there's three angels. Um, well, they've read all sorts of stuff into these three angels via Ellen White. And it's these three angels messages that they think they've specially been tasked with to take to the world. And the third angels message is the warning, the final warning. You need to come out of apostate Protestant and, and Roman Catholic churches and come join God's last day, Seventh Day Adventist remnant, mm. or you're going to get the mark of the beast. This is coming from the great controversy. And okay. all Adventists are going to know this because a lot of them were won to the Adventist movement by this message, the third angels heralding of get out of these churches, they're Babylon, they're going to have the wrath of God poured out on them, you're going to get the mark of the beast, which is going to church on Sunday, um, that's the papal Sabbath, okay. and you need to keep God's seventh day Sabbath um, if you want to receive the seal of God. So there supposedly is going to be a Sunday law that comes down the pike that's headed up by the papacy in a threefold union between Rome, um, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism, and basically the whole world. <laughs> is going to form this pact and make a Sunday law. And we're going to hunt down, supposedly, you and I, especially people like me, former Adventists, yeah. we're going to hunt down by government demand um, Seventh-day Adventists for going to church on Saturday, and we're going to kill them. And so... And they, this is this is rank and file teaching within the SDA church is what you're saying. This is the, the, what yes. you're describing right here. This is not some scholarly elite. This is commonplace teaching. Yes. If okay. you look, watch their It Is Written seminars, they go around town to town. They've been doing this since their pioneer days. They've just handed down these same things from the pioneer days. If you go to one of their, um, they call them crusades, or they used to call them that. I don't know if they, evangelistic series. Like a revival um, meeting, they, that thing. Yeah, yeah they, they have these different titles for them. It's a ton of information just slammed onto a person in like a week. And it's going to take till about typically like Wednesday or Thursday of that week before they start whipping out the apostate Protestants and they're going to hell and they're deceived. They hate the law of God. Um, they're commandment breakers, mm. this type stuff. Um, but that, yes, that that's going to be whipped out. And there is an undertone throughout Seventh-day Adventist culture of the pagan Sunday Christians. Wink, wink, like they're, eh, the, you know, the, the confused Christians. They're the deceived Christians. They're following after Rome and the papacy. Mm. Um, there's a lot of that that permeates a lot of Adventist culture and life. But all that to say that the great controversy theme informs all of their theology. So the theology and what's being taught to them from the pulpit, whether they hear. Now, what I'm telling you is coming through the lens of what's called the great controversy theme. No, I, you know, there's probably very few pastors out there that are teaching like that. But the ministers understand that and are trained in their institutions where their scholars are very aware of the stuff like Herbert Douglas. Mm. And that is then passed down to the, the clergy and the clergy then disperses the teaching at its end point down the river, okay. not back up at top of the river, at the base of the river. And you're just getting the end result of the product already filtered through the theme. Gotcha. And, and from the language you're using, um, this is painted kind of with the broad brush strokes or the, the the paint swatches of eschatology. I mean, you're 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 pulling from imagery from Revelation, from Ezekiel. So this is very much an eschatological message that is for the the person in the pew. One hundred percent. It is okay. a. Uh, it is not eschatology is not a secondary doctrine in Adventism. There's no room for outside of premillennial historicism. Okay. And pre and they have to have. Go no, ahead. I was going to ask you to like. Pre premillennial, and then that uh, that qualifier historicism. Just a, could you give a brief explanation of that differentiation, maybe from how others would interpret premillennialism? Yeah. So the historicist aspect is their school of interpretation of eschatology and, and prophecy, essentially. Okay. Um, the premillennial aspect is that they believe in a future one thousand literal millennial reign. But the unique aspect for their system that's different than other premillennialists is they believe the millennial reign will take place in heaven. Okay, okay. It's, it's actually going to be a thousand-year fact-checking session of the work that God did in the investigative judgment. Where Because in this whole thing, uh, in the great controversy, God has to vindicate his character now. The big thing they'll say is, because they say we have the answers to the big questions, like, well, if, God's, if, if God knew that Lucifer was going to sin and let sin into the world, why didn't God just obliterate him? 
Mm. So they use these things like this, like we have the answers to these questions type stuff to, to, you know, to intrigue people. And in this controversy, God has to vindicate his character. And the reason he didn't do that was because that would only prove Satan's accusations that God's not fair to be true. Because when Jesus was exalted, Lucifer then went around in heaven and started spreading rumors um, that God's law is not fair, that it can't be kept. And he sought to then set up his own government of self-governance. And so you had two kingdoms within one another. Interesting. And and Satan recruited, or Lucifer, who became Satan, recruited a third of the angels, and the angels were trying to convince him, no, no, you don't know what you're doing. We can worship Jesus. He's he's good. And Satan just refused. And so war broke out in heaven. So the verses of, in scripture that talk about war in heaven, mm-hmm. like in Revelation, right. they import all these extra controversy details. So Satan was then booted from heaven and sent to earth. And then that's actually when the... Uh, the whole fall of man that I was telling you about earlier, that's where that then picks up. But in this is this accusation that God's law can't be kept, that he's a tyrant and it's not fair. So the whole war that's going on in this great controversy is between you either believing God or believing Satan. It's the very stereotypical like angel on the shoulder and demon on the other. Man's kind of like neutral being like pulled in like two directions and Mm. you just have to make a choice. Who are you going to, you know, stand with in the controversy? Okay. That's kind of the message that's going on. And so part of that then influences what they think about why Jesus came and what the gospel is. They think that the idea that Christians understand we can't keep the law perfectly. Mm. They think that's a lie from Satan. Okay. Because that's part of this great controversy. That's what Satan said in heaven. And so part of the good news is that through the help of the Holy Spirit, you can keep the law perfectly, demonstrating to the world God's law can be kept and God is honest and we can believe him. Mm. Well, all of that to loop around, because your initial question was about the the millennial reign, um, the millennial reign is going to be a thousand year period of those who make it through the investigative judgment, who are then able to review God's work so that they can then go, oh, okay. Because they'll want to be like, well, why isn't grandma here? And they think in their mind that like, then God will like show them, well, here's the record of their life and here's all the times they reject it. So then the person can go, oh, okay, God is just and fair in doing what he's doing. So this whole thing comes back to God having to vindicate himself against the accusations of Satan. His hands are tied, so to speak. How interesting. So this is making a lot more sense though, how you're describing this, this great controversy is not just a doctrine, but instead, this is a this is kind of a, a whole worldview. This is a way of seeing yes. all of life and all of scripture, and certainly all those yes. biblical writings you're referencing. That's that's really interesting. Walk us into because you you referred to this. Walk us in the into the investigative judgment, though, specifically how that plays in, um, where that doctrine comes from. Because I know for for many people, we may be familiar with the term investigative judgment, um, but the way you're describing it, I think, is really helpful. So walk yes. us, walk us into that, Miles. So this is a very advanced doctrine. You will talk with a lot of Seventh-day Adventists. They don't even understand it. They're not able to articulate it. It is very convoluted. A lot of Adventists, especially I've talked with pastors and stuff before, and one of the common things they'll say initially when I before I go to talk to with them is, well, remember, it's complicated. Okay. We need to remember that. And it's kind of to set the stage that there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. And that's because this thing has has shifted and changed and new excuses have been given because really this is what Adventism seventh day Adventism was born out of. This really is the central pillar that all roads do lead back to even the great controversy theme. Okay. I know that Herbert Douglas said in that article that he mentioned, you know, for example, the thing that makes seventh Adventism uh, unique is not just our, our sanctuary and investigative judgment teaching, but rather the great controversy theme. And that is true. But 1844 is the crux of it. So you have to understand a little bit about Millerism and the Second Great Awakening. Adventism was a broader movement as a whole. It was basically a a movement raising up at a time and and region where um, my spiritual ancestors and some of your spiritual ancestors um, had made great strides in a, um, I don't know exactly what your eschatology is. Um, I'm in a post-millennial school of thought. And so it was an area and region very heavily influenced by the the P 
Puritan uh, post-millennialist ideology that the here and the now really matters, really establishing your roots, covenantal succession, those types of things. Mm -hmm. So Miller coming around with an imminent return of Christ message um, was not like it is today. It was a very anomalous, kind of like my view today would be the anomalous one for, for most people. Most people tend to be doom and gloom in their eschatology. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless um, Miller was essentially preaching the return of Christ being imminent. He used all sorts of crazy math um, scripturally speaking, and he used the same erroneous principle that many um, have used through the ages of the kind of Bible and me under a tree sure. sort of reading of the Bible, disconnected, right. denuded from history. Um, and he arrived at the date October 22nd, or sorry, sorry, sorry. It was just the year of 1843. And through that, 1843 came and and went. How did they arrive at 1843? Or how did he? The central pillar verse for that was Daniel 814. Okay. After 2300 days, which that's a King James rendering, it actually says evening and morning. The word yom is not there in the Hebrew, um, which is a big, big problem for their position because they use the day year principle. Mm. And so using the day year principle with Daniel 814, he and, and a bunch of other math, um, he arrived at the year 1843 for the return of Christ. That came and went in the spring of 1844. They continued and said it was it, they were off by a year um, because uh, I've seen some people say that it was they were saying um, they didn't account for the year zero. And so, it, oh, we were off by one year. Well, in the spring, um, a crazy crackpot of a guy named Samuel Snow, who believed that he was the reincarnation of Elisha, the prophet before the second coming. Oh my. Uh, he he arrived at the date specifically using a bunch of other crazy wonky math that he claimed was uh, Jewish in origin. He arrived at October 22nd, 1844. So then it became October 22nd, 1844. That came and went. It's now historically known as the Great Disappointment. Hmm. Out of this, the majority of the people in this movement went back to their other denominations because they were basically like an ecumenical mix of Presbyterians, Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, etc. Most of them went back to these movements. But a small group called the Little Flock at that time refused to accept that they were wrong and sought to find, in their words, meaning in the disappointment. Mm. So the next day, October 23rd, 1844, a guy by the name of Hiram Edson is walking through a field Probably distraught, probably didn't sleep at night, because if you study this time period, it's sad. It's very sad. They didn't harvest their crops. I mean, these people really believed this, and that didn't happen, and their lives are now ruined. Right. And so he probably didn't sleep, full of distress and distraught. The next day, claims to be walking through a cornfield on his way to meet some of this other little flock to discuss the, the next move, basically. Right. Claims to have a vision and be shown a vision in a, in a field. And it was that Christ was actually not returning to earth on that day. He actually entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary for the first time. Miller was teaching that October 22nd, or that, yeah, the, the October 22nd and the 1843, 1844 dates were pointing to when Jesus would return to earth and cleanse the earth with fire. And that the, the cleansing of the temple was in reference to the earth, okay. which would be cleansed by fire. Higher medicine claimed in his vision that he was shown they weren't wrong about the date and uh, the time. They were wrong about the event and the location. Okay. That actually it wasn't him returning to earth. It was him entering into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the investigative judgment. That's what it f then formally went on to be um, labeled. He didn't call it that at that time. He basically then gave this, this message to a guy by the name of O.R.L. Crozier, who then went to publish this in what was called uh, the Day Star, which was an Adventist publication at the time. And this theory and idea started spreading. Hmm. Well, the way that theology and the way that, uh, well, in Adventism, the way that their theology was cemented into the system as being the correct thing is by means of Ellen White. So a lot of people don't understand that she didn't actually originate any doctrines. She just claimed to be given vision by God, confirming what they had been studying. So this was one of those areas where she claimed that um, in vision, she was shown that this was to be the, the case and that this was correct. 
and that God then gave the stamp of approval on this. Her first vision came in December of 1844, so roughly three months after the Great Disappointment. And uh, you can listen to it actually um, on YouTube. There's a high quality recording, and uh, like an audio book. It's about 19 minutes of, if people are interested, Ellen White's first vision. Okay. And so that's what it's essentially in part discussing. The second vision, which is actually the most problematic one, um, it it further supposedly confirmed the investigative judgment of Jesus getting up from the holy place and entering into the most holy place. So that's in a nutshell where it came from. I know that that was a, a lot there, but right, that's right. In, in that's in in uh, a summation where it's essentially coming from, and then the stamp of approval coming from God. Now the question is, what is the teaching? Well, Desmond Ford, um, the late Doctor Ford, was a um, Seventh Day Adventist pastor who essentially was disfellowshipped um, due to his views on this specific doctrine. And so he wrote that massive of a book dealing with the investigative judgment. So as you can see how thick that is, um, this is a very complex doctrine. So I will give you kind of the overview here. Um, I'm not obviously going to give every single jot and tittle in detail. I also point to this book as well, because in there, he points out how it's evolved over time. What, it, what they were saying in the 19th century compared to the 20th to the 21st, there's been an evolution and there's still people in the midst who still maybe, oh, and I hold to the 19th century idea and version. Okay. Oh, there's some that believe some of the changes from the 20s. So it's such a mix now. That's why it's so confusing for um, many Adventists, I think, because right. in order to keep this thing alive, they've had to evolve and whatnot over time. And so... With that said, let me read to you a brief overview and steel man of what the investigative judgment is. And then afterward, I'll be happy to, because like I said, I know that this is kind of a lot. And afterward, I'll uh, I'll see any sort of questions. That Miles, you just to frame this again, what you're what you're saying is the we were look we were looking earlier at the great controversy, but the great controversy teaching this is flowing from what we're talking about here with the great disappointment and the investigative judgment. This is kind of the fountain from which those other things flow. Is that correct? Really, it is because if 1844 is falsified, then the movement's built on a lie. You okay. don't even have a great controversy vision if 1840. You know, 1844 was the response to the being wrong. Gotcha. And the, the the solution to, oh, no, we weren't wrong. So right. this you have to affirm all of Miller's 15 proofs, which they never discuss and talk about. The only one they'll ever talk about is Daniel 814, which still the, the Daniel 814 is not going to change. You know, mm. it is what it, it says, what it says. And so right. they all the solutions they've tried to come up with because you have to twist it and you can't take it for what it's actually saying. Um, and you have to pour all this other stuff in. It causes you to now cause all sorts of other issues. So then they try and correct there and it just continues to make issues. So, okay. yeah, it, it really is all downstream of, of this because this was the response to the great disappointment. Okay. If this is wrong and, and God's stamp of approval isn't actually on this, Ellen White is a false prophet. Um, 1844 was a fraud. And the, the people in the high echelons of the movement, they, they know this. They understand okay. this. And okay. so this is my steel man of the position, which is compiled from a, a book of Ellen White's called uh, Christ in his sanctuary, and it's from chapters seven through nine. So this is it in a nutshell. There is a sanctuary in heaven. They are physicalists, by the way. So they believe that heaven is through Orion's belt because that's what Ellen White said. Oh, okay. And if if you were to travel up there and go through it, you would actually arrive at heaven. Like in a spaceship, um, one could just travel straight up through. Uh, essentially, yeah, okay. because it's through Orion's belt. It's not, uh, it's not, well, they're, they're, they're physical. It's like all of reality to them. There really is no immaterial reality. They'll say that they believe in spirit and stuff, but then when you start talking to them, um, I actually just did a stream on this. Uh, I'll save the, the words there. I just did a stream on this on my channel. If, if people are curious about the physicalism of Adventism, but I say that to say when they say there's a sanctuary in heaven, they believe that what was on earth was only a scale model of what is actually up in heaven. Okay. So it's this physical building. It's identical to that of the earthly in that the one on earth was a scale model. They claim that in 1844, Jesus entered the most holy place of this sanctuary for the first time to begin what they call the investigative judgment. 
Prior to this, he only entered into the holy place of that sanctuary to do a work of intercession analogous to that of the Levitical Aaronic priesthood, like in Leviticus 16. This is a core chapter of the Bible for them, Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. Okay. They also claim that this investigative judgment is the final phase of Christ's atoning ministry prior to the second coming. This is to say, the atonement was not complete at the cross, but it continues in heaven until this work of investigation is finalized. In this judgment, the record books of sin are opened and the lives of all who have professed faith come up in review before God. It is a judgment only for professed believers. That's a key part. It's a judgment only for professed believers. The wicked, according to their theology, will be investigated and judged during the thousand-year millennium. So that's kind of some of what I was telling you about earlier. It's not just going to be you fact-checking God's work. It's also going to be you seeing why God is going to annihilate the wicked. That is just in the action that you're going to see take place. Gotcha. Beginning with the cases of the dead, spanning back to Adam and Eve, Jesus is reviewing the life records of every person who has professed faith in God. Every name is mentioned and every case is closely examined. When he finishes with one generation, he moves to the next. Once the cases of the dead are complete, he will move to the cases of the living. None know when this will happen. Anyone who has sins remaining upon the books of record, whether unconfessed or forgotten, will have their names blotted out of the book of life. Every sin must be confessed to be blotted out. The standard that all people are judged against is the Ten Commandments and their perfect obedience to them, especially the seventh-day Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. Some names of professed believers will be accepted, others will be rejected. When every person has come up in review, only then will Jesus plead his blood before the Father on behalf of those who are found worthy and then blots out their sins from the record books. Then... Brace yourself, Josh. Not knowing whether this work has been completed, those who are found worthy, still in their current human state, will have to stand in the sight of Almighty God without an intercessor. This is prior to the second advent. Oh my. Jesus will then take the sins of God's people and transfer them to Satan, who they believe is represented by the Leviticus 16 Day of Atonement scapegoat. Hmm. Satan will bear the ultimate responsibility for all the sins he has caused the righteous to commit, suffering for them in the lake of fire to eventually be blotted from existence, making Satan the final sin bearer. This completes the atonement. Wow. This then supposedly vindicates the character of God before all watching intelligences. So I'll note here, they believe that there are all sorts of other intelligent life out there in the in, in other universes and stuff okay. like that, and they're all watching in on Earth at this controversy that's going on. This then will supposedly vindicate the character of God before all watching intelligences, and everyone will see the immutability of the law of God and his righteous character. So this entire thing is to supposedly vindicate God. Okay. And that's the doctrine in a nutshell. Wow. I'm not even sure how to respond to that one, Miles. There's so much you just said right there. Um, So are you seeing how it's a different gospel? it's it's a it's a whole different uh like i said this this is like a completely um foreign worldview it's a it's a foreign cosmology it's a foreign worldview but that's very interesting how that flows into that that investigative judgment how how commonplace is that understood because i'm very interested how how person in the pew this is hitting those who are in sda circles is this something that's widely i know you said it's uh, held by varying degrees, and there's there's confusion between different people. But as far as as far as the the broad brushstrokes of what you just walked through, is that pretty widely understood by SDAs? I wouldn't say that every bit of that is. Like I said, I went and systematized that from Ellen White's book herself. I've read Christ in His Sanctuary. It's only like nine chapters. I've okay. read it like twenty five times probably, and gotcha. so most SDAs are not doing that. The way that this is going to manifest itself with SDAs is it's going to impact even the SDAs who are going to say stuff like, why reject the investigative judgment? Because you're going to run into those. Okay. The, the, what, they, what they would call a liberal Adventist. You don't agree with the foundational fundamental teachings or you pick and choose which ones you do. Okay. Um, so you kind of, we call it, a lot of former Adventists, we call that like Adventism light. 
Okay. Where you're trying to like, oh, well, I'm an Adventist, but I don't believe Ellen White. Um, that's the subtle drift that will lead you away from Adventism because then you start to realize, well, this whole thing's predicated on her. The way that it's going to make itself uh, seen, though, in the people who may not even know all the mechanics or even say they reject the investigative judgment is how they think they're reconciled to God. Right. That's where the subtle deception comes in. Because in all of this, I can uh, read you a quote if you like. Um, So that's not all that she said about this investigative judgment. Um, This is Testimonies for the Church, uh, Volume 4, page 294. And uh, she says, quote, Man who has defaced the image of God in his soul by a corrupt life cannot by mere human effort affect a radical change in himself. He must accept the provisions of the gospel. He must be reconciled to God through obedience to his law and faith in Christ. His life from thenceforth must be governed by a new principle. Through repentance, faith, and good works, he may perfect a righteous character and then claim, through the merits of Christ, the privileges of the sons of God. Mm. Okay. So this is their this is their system in in its teaching around what sanctification is. So this is how the great controversy theme influences and informs their the way that this person would understand sanctification. So even if they don't know it's coming from the great controversy theme and how it's influencing it, what they're being told about what sanctification is is coming from all of that. And it's it's this idea that you're gradually imparted over time based on your obedience and good works alongside God. Mm. who's seeking all he's doing all he can it's like synergism on steroids okay is gradually imparting to you grace that is eventually trying to get things like this all right to where you're then boom now you're there and they consider that to be what they call righteousness by faith or uh the righteousness of christ it's not an alien foreign righteousness like paul mentions in philippians uh three nine through ten that is uh you know not imparted to you gradually over time, but is actually imputed on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not that it's that you will eventually have a righteousness that mirrors that of Jesus. Over time, you were progressively sanctified and got to a point where now you can essentially make it through the investigative judgment because in the investigative judgment, you have to um, pass this thing as you heard with not a single sin on the record books. I think that was the part the problem. Too, I felt myself so sucked in by your narrative there. I, I didn't even know what to say because I was hearing you talk about standing before God with no mediator. That language is just so striking. But in but in SDA yeah. teachings, then that is kind of the eschatological fruition of this is where you stand before Almighty God and yet with no mediator. Yep, because after this investigation, investigative judgment is done, the period of probation has ceased. So they have a whole doctrine around probation okay. that... The good news is that probation has been extended. That was part of their shift as well from 1840, uh, from the the whole, this narrative being born. Ellen White claimed in this vision when Jesus got up and moved from the holy place to the most holy place, um, that was an extension of probation. God could have just laid down the hammer and it was over, but he wanted more people to be saved. Probation on our behalf then, this is a probation of mankind. Yeah, so he extended that period, and we're in that period now. So part of the good news is that in Adventism, you can have a clean slate when you have a come to Christ moment. Okay. But moving forward, your obedience to the Ten Commandments is essentially what is going to determine if you are finally justified. Okay. So a high view because of the you law have to get a very foreign view of the law to most Protestants. Yes. So, and they love to pray on that and say, well, look at all the Protestants, you know, they don't, they, they've completely disregarded the law. They essentially think every Protestant is an antinomian. Okay. And so, um, they're, and, and to be fair, they see people like that and people like that, their system can seem like, oh yeah. Um, because a lot of people have just surrendered the law to the Adventist church and I refuse to do that. Yeah. So, but that's the way it's going to make itself out in for, in people who may not actually understand the mechanics behind it. It's their understanding of like, well, what is sanctification? Well, it's getting to a point where um, you're essentially sinlessly perfect in this life and needing to, because at, when I was an Adventist man, I thought about Satan all the time. 
I was really? constantly thinking about Satan. I, I can't tell you how many former Adventists I've talked to too. And it was the same thing for them as well, because you're constantly thinking about the great controversy. Like anytime you're going to do, you know, anything, um, you're constantly thinking about like, am I standing for Christ or am I standing for Satan here? Is there a sin that I've, I didn't remember that I need to confess? Um, and that's going to take different forms, obviously, for different people in terms of if they believe that aspect or understand that aspect of it. But mm -hmm. it informs all of their understanding around these different doctrines that are just foundational to the Christian faith, like right. their understanding of justification, sanctification, that sort of stuff. Right. Man, I, I so want to dive into the law part because that's such an interesting and that's such a timely. Well, do you have do you have time, Miles? Do we have a couple of minutes? Yeah. Okay. Just just real quick, because I do want to get into the three questions specifically in, in relations to the full preterism kind of uh, kerfuffle that's been going on in those three kind of orthodox questions that were floated. But but walk me into the law a little bit, because um, there, there's an ongoing discussion right now about the, the application of God's law, whether God's law is still applicable. Um, there's been a, a pretty uh, current, as of the time of this recording, a pretty current um, debate going on online as to whether God's law is still applicable, whether God's moral law is abiding, whether uh, the Ten Commandments, for example, and you've mentioned Sabbatarianism several times, but like whether these things are eternal and eternal reflection of God's will that that uh, governments and rulers do well to submit to, specifically because it's God's will for nations and for people. Walk, walk me into that just a little bit, because how closely does that play with the SDA belief? Because obviously you're talking about law, not in regards to how Christians are called to live and how all of humanity is called to submit to the king who makes the law. You're talking, though, about Correct. somebody earning salvation. Um, you're talking about this progressive obedience to the law through which you're um, made righteous. But but walk me into that just a little bit, Miles. I didn't prep you for this question, so just as as, as much as you want to. Yeah, um, well, you, you hit it right there that... Um, we're not talking about like a threefold use of the law, right? For example, right? Um, we're, we're talking about the law is a reconciliation tool. Okay, that's the primary error because they are correct in a lot of their assessment and application um, regarding um, the law of God being good, righteous, and holy, uh, etc. Um, the when issue they say law, becomes Miles. When they say law, are they thinking a monolithic structure of the law, or that you said not a tripartite division? So we're not thinking threefold use of the law, but you're thinking of just one whole whole uh, item. Well, so they would agree in the sense of like uh, ceremonial law, moral law, etc. Okay. Um, but what I mean by that is when we oftentimes talk about a threefold use. We're talking about threefold use, um, not, not, not tripartite division. I got you now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. A, a threefold use gotcha. of the law. Gotcha. Um, they, they also, when they use the term, the law, they're referring to the 10 commandments. Okay. So they believe that there was a distinction between what God gave Moses and what Moses gave the people. All the rest of everything outside of the Decalogue was given by Moses and that was written on parchment and put outside of the ark. And the Ten Commandments were housed inside the ark, showing a distinction and separation between the two. Oh. That's the sort of thing and argument they're going to make, um, which I've debunked that, by the way, on my channel, um, showing that, no, that's that's not the case. So if people are interested, they can check that out. But they mean the Ten Commandments. Okay. And so the law goes back to the start of the Great Controversy. That's what Satan started because they believe the Ten Commandments are eternal. They're actually what's governing heaven. So how angels are supposed to obey their parents and not commit adultery, that sort of thing, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But they think the Ten Commandments are um, in heaven. Ellen White claimed to see them there. There's a giant Ten Commandments statue up there. And that's what Satan started pointing at and accusing and all this stuff. But okay. they believe the Ten Commandments are eternal. And um, I'm thinking that, sorry, I'm thinking now back on what you were saying as well about theonomy. Um, they would probably freak out if they understood that discussion and maybe some of their theologians and, and scholars do, they would see that as a further uh, evidence that their system is totally true. The apostate Protestants are trying to take over the government. Okay. They're trying to enforce, they're trying to enforce the fake papal Sabbath on everybody. Gotcha. They did the same thing in the 1800s when there were blue laws, um, right. the 18, 1900s. Um, and they didn't understand really at all what the idea and thinking was behind that. It had nothing to do with reaching across the aisle and shaking hands with the papacy and forming a threefold union and all this other extra baggage that they bring. Um, okay. But nevertheless, that's that's how they would view that. That They would say, see, that's just more evidence. Ellen White was correct. We're about there. It's about to come down the pike. They're trying to take over and overthrow the government. And because they have this very like God's going to burn all this up. We're just waiting to get out of here. 
type um, idea. Um, and you, so the idea mentioned, of you'd mentioned having a, a kind of optimistic eschatology. So th there's is we could say a decidedly kind of negative eschatology in that sense. Absolutely. Okay. Without a doubt. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting yeah. though that 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 you were saying that they would react against theonomy because that makes a lot of sense from the picture you were painting though as far as this is the these are kind of the mile markers of the end type thing. Um, yeah. Miles, I got to get to our questions. Um, let me let me walk us into this because there's been. Uh, there's been a little bit of discussion as well, not only on theonomy, but also on uh, preterism and specifically full or hyper preterism, however one uh, defines that. Uh, but there's been three questions that have been floated. And I was curious to get your take with uh, the SDA teachings, which are so inherently, as you've as you painted the picture, eschatological. You know, it's painting a whole cosmology, a whole system worldview of, of understanding these things, but specifically with an eschatological bent. Um, I was curious how they would answer these three questions. So typically the three questions that have been listed are um, whether one can affirm biblically um, a future bodily return of Christ, whether one can affirm a future physical generation, um, general just resurrection uh, specifically, and whether one can uh, affirm that history concludes with the final judgment of all men. So future bodily return of Christ, uh, future physical general resurrection, and then a future uh, final judgment of all men. How, how would an SDA theologian or, or teacher answer those questions? They would affirm all of those. Okay. B big time. Um, let me walk you through now. Um, each of each of those three. So Good. they most certainly affirm the bodily return of Christ. That's they oftentimes love to point to that, say it's in our name, Adventist. That's what Adventist means. Um, it's oftentimes what they try to use to shield themselves from criticism with Ellen White, the investigative judgment, the great controversy, etc., by just pointing to the words Seventh Day Adventist and okay. acting as though the only thing that makes you an Adventist is, well, I believe in the Seventh Day Sabbath and the return of Christ. Interesting. Well, well, no, man, that's just you're doing your co the cop out of like, that's that's not at all what only makes a Seventh-day Adventist. That would make Seventh-day Baptist, Seventh-day <laughs> Adventist. Right. So it's like, no, no, man, that's not. But anyways, they do affirm, obviously, the bodily return of Christ. Um, it's actually funny on this topic. Um, and I'm speaking from my own experience here. I'm not just talking out of the side of my neck. I've heard multiple people say this, but specifically university professors. This is actually something that they will they tell the students that the Ad, the Seventh Day Adventists are the only group that actually believes in the bodily return of Christ. Really? That everyone that everyone else has fallen into the trap of thinking it was a spiritual return, kind of like the full preterists do. Interesting. So Adventism very regularly, Josh, functions in a false binary. Okay. It's always their position or you're this. Okay. Yeah. And it was predicated on the region, like I was mentioning earlier, that this movement was born in um, and how you didn't have internet at that time. So it's oftentimes the other position is one that may have been popular around that day and age in their region. Mm. So that's the other that people are oftentimes caricatured as as holding to as the opposite to the Adventist position. And so there were a number of people at their time who were saying, and I, I think the Adventist pioneers were not correctly understanding what they were reading. Um, it was partial preterism, and it was the idea of Christ returning in judgment in AD 70, but that those same individuals were not full preterists saying that was the second coming of Christ, but that that was Christ coming in judgment on that generation. Um, as well as groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, who were on the rise at the same time, who also came out of the general Adventist movement, um, who believe in a spiritual resurrection. Okay. So because that was like a heavy influence at that day, it's been carried down to this day, this sort of straw man caricature of other Christians. Um, but yes, they, they do say that. And I had a professor who I had to have a discussion with afterwards and say, man, that's not true. I'm not an, you know, and I... I'm not an Adventist, I told him, and we got into discussing this, and it's like, that's like not true at all. This is like a foundational, fundamental, orthodox Christian. I mean, it's right. in the Apostles' Creed. Right. Like, th this is like um, a foundational, fundamental. So it's just kind of bizarre to to be telling people that. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's at this return, the second advent, that those who are alive and have made it through the investigative judgment. And we're able to stand before Almighty God without an intercessor. Um, oh, yeah, we, we kind of got sidetracked there. But when the period of probation ends, then there's going to be a courtroom scene where Jesus is standing and advocating and Satan's going to be there accusing. Okay, you're this not going to the be investigative there. judgment scenario. 
this is after the investigative judgment. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Right. But this is, but after the investigative judgment, but before the second coming. Okay. I'm with you. There will be a period where there's going to be a courtroom scene where Satan is going to be in there accusing God's people, but Jesus is going to be able to show that he's just and able to save them. Hmm. All their sins were confessed. So God's completely fair, which that will then silence the accusations of Satan. Hmm. In this period is when you're going to have to be able to stand before Almighty God without an intercessor because Jesus is going to move from being an intercessor to the advocate in this courtroom scene. So after you've made it through the investigative judgment and you were able to stand before Almighty God without an intercessor, meaning you attained to sinless perfectionism, you will be translated, which is their version of like in the twinkling of an eye, you'll be changed. Okay, yeah. And you'll be taken to heaven where the millennial reign will happen in heaven, not on earth for a thousand years. And the dead that are that are uh, that made it through the investigative judgment, the righteous dead, they will be resurrected at that time as well. OK. And taken the, the wicked dead will remain in the grave for the second resurrection, hmm. which will be the resurrection to condemnation. Okay. Yep. So the dead that made it through this judgment will also be resurrected and translated. And then those that are alive will be translated and they'll be taken to heaven for the millennial reign. And the millennial reign in their view is like I said, is basically this like fact checking session, um, fact checking the work of God to see like, okay, he's just, we can trust him. Mm. That type seven. That's some of the language that they've used. I mean, I, I reviewed that a couple of weeks ago on my channel. One of these big name seventh day Adventist pastors, uh, Stephen Bohr. That's the language he used is that it's going to be this period of time for us to be able to breathe a sigh of relief saying, okay, we can trust him. Wow. Like you're going to be with almighty God and have, to, it's just crazy, man. Wow. Um, but yeah, it'll basically be a fact checking session. Um, they'll be able to look over his work. Um, and it's all about God having to vindicate himself. The final judgment in their view now is a judicial process that includes a number of things over a period of time. Okay. So you have the pre-Advent investigative judgment. The verses that they're going to use to support this are Daniel chapter 7. They don't believe that that was at the ascension of Christ, approaching the Father, receiving his kingdom. That's something that's currently taking place. Okay. Um, as well as Romans 2, 5 through 6, which I think is interesting because it's like there's just a lot of reading into the text. But that's those are a couple of places they're going to use to support this idea. Then you have the millennium judgment or the millennial judgment they'll point to revelation 20 verse 4 for example mm -hmm. um first corinthians 6 uh 13 i think it is as well um and then there's the executive judgment after the millennium and they'll point to revelation 20 um uh, 11 through 15 and matthew 25 31 through like 46 mm -hmm. So they say that the final judgment begins before the second coming and includes the judgment of the saints and the judgment of the wicked during and after the millennium. Wow. So after this millennial reign in heaven, Satan during this period will actually be bound on the earth for a thousand years where he won't be able. That's how they get the idea of Satan being bound and not being able to tempt anyone. Well, no one's going to be here because the wicked that are alive when Jesus this, during the second advent to take them to the millennial reign in heaven Anyone that's not translated and the the righteous that are not resurrected, the wicked, they'll be killed. Okay. His brightness is going to essentially kill them. Then all of the wicked will still be dead in their graves. The millennial reign will happen, which is in a this fact-checking session, but also the saints who are there doing that fact-checking are also going to be judging the wicked. They're going to be looking over these books to see that God is just in this annihilation that's going to take place. Hmm. So then after the thousand years is over, they will return and the new Jerusalem will descend from heaven. There will be the resurrection of the wicked where Satan will have been here for a thousand years bound. He will then lead the charge with this wicked resurrected those that have picked his side. And it will be like the final cosmic collision between Christ and Satan. And they'll be as they come and try and overthrow the new Jerusalem. They're going to be obliterated with fire and be annihilated. And then there'll be new heaven and new earth. So yes, but with a asterisk beside it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because there's all this extra. And again, you're gonna get Adventist men who think that 
this is the area they're going to want to talk about. Okay. They think they've cracked every code, every number, every sign, every symbol. It's unquestionable. Their eschatology, they think, is just bulletproof. Um, it's going to come from that standpoint. This is an area where they're going to be chomping at the bit because this is the stuff that your Adventist, general Adventist, they're going to know these things. Now, oh, again, it's funny because it's funny because um, that investigative judgment is a part of all of this, but many of those same people will tell you they reject the investigative judgment, yet they believe about the millennial reign the same. Well, all this stuff is a system. You can't yeah. just pick and choose. It's all connected. And so a lot of people I don't think are able to kind of catch it at that level or they're not thinking maybe systematically like that. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, it's it's got a bunch of added details and it's all predicated off of this whole controversy around Christ and Satan that then that becomes the accumulation of, uh, um, yeah, the, right. the scapegoat, for example, with, with Satan is he's supposedly kicked off the mountain with the blood placed on him where he's then kicked down to the earth. Okay. And that's the, uh, that's typological of what they think, uh, is happening in Leviticus 16 is, um, the lots were cast, which is a problem for their position. Um, mm. and the Lord's goat was Jesus, but the scapegoat is Satan. And they say that this is because he's ultimately responsible for sin. And so they say that the scapegoat typified responsibility, which is a key aspect, but the text says nothing about responsibility. It talks about um, essentially expiation, the right. removal of sin from the, the, the people. Um, and so they think that that essentially happens with Satan because they say there's no way that Jesus could be the scapegoat. Look, there's still sin in the universe. Sin's not been done away with. That will happen when... Uh, the sins are placed on Satan, who is kicked off of the mountain, which is what the the priest would do or the fit man would do by leading the scapegoat out. And they'll oftentimes point to like apocryphal text to say, well, legend has it that they used to take them to a mountain and kick them off the mountain because they didn't want the goat to return to the camp. So that same thing is pictured for us in Revelation 20, where Jesus is going to kick Satan off of the mountain with the sins placed on him. Wow. And and he's going to be. <laughs> Yeah, essentially uh, annihilated. But that's how sin is actually removed from the universe. And part of the sinless perfectionism, too, gets into a little bit of what I was saying earlier about this idea that you have to demonstrate that you're fit for the new heavens and the new earth and that you can be trusted to not let sin ever enter again. Mm. So unlike the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, the end there where we have a contrast between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion and what makes Mount Zion better, um, one of the aspects of it is that it's an unshakable kingdom. The things that are shakable um, have essentially been, well, well, in that final fruition in the new heaven and the new earth, the reason sin won't enter again is not because we can then be trusted to not let sin enter into eternity again. Right. Um, it's actually that Christ is a perfect savior. That's really what it comes down to and that he's purified, make, made all things new, and the, the new heavens and the new earth will be an unshakable kingdom because mm. of that, because Christ is ruling and reigning. And so... Um, it's a very, very different view in their system. Miles, we were talking before we started recording just about words and how to use words. I, I, good grief, because that's that with the asterisk, how you can affirm these things and we're using the same language and we're talking about the same events. And yet the, the picture yeah. you are painting is so much different um, than what we'd normally paint. I'm going to recommend for sure people check out your channel. Remind us of the channel. Remind us where to follow you. Um, I know. Um, you've mentioned several different videos that you've done that kind of suss in some of the the, the mm -hmm. uh, lines in between these doctrines, but where can they follow you and where are you at? Yeah, so um, I'm in the middle of building answeringadventism.com. That will be live this summer, which will be a great resource for people, predominantly the Q&A library section on the website, which is going to have hundreds, eventually thousands of claims, questions, et cetera, that you'll often hear from Seventh-day Adventists that the church makes, et cetera, with responses to those um, really kind of wading through all the fog and the haze for Christians, um, because that's really what my ministry is about. It's about uh, predominantly educating Christians. Mm -hmm. um, because after having this discussion, you're now seeing the importance of we need to be sharing the gospel with these people. Right. They're not just evangelicals that go to church on Saturday and are potentially vegetarians. Mm -hmm. um, those two things are a part of a bigger issue around the seal of God being fit for heaven, the health message, the vegetarianism. We didn't even touch on that. That's part of this being fit for heaven and being fit and returning to the diet of Eden and all this sort of stuff. 
And so um, my ministry is really about getting Christians caught up to speed and cutting through the fog and the haze for them. And so working on answeringadventism.com, that will be live this summer, um, but predominantly my YouTube channel. You can just go onto YouTube and type in answeringadventism.com or not .com, the website's stuck in my head now, right, right. answering Adventism into the, the search bar and my channel will pop up. Or you can do the the URL is youtube.com slash at and then answering Adventism. Um, and my channel will uh, will pop up. Uh, and yeah, the videos that I mentioned in this stream, um, you should be able to find them by the the title. So Okay, Miles, there's like you said, we didn't even get get to vegetables. Um, maybe we could follow no. up another conversation. There's so much there. Yeah. Um, thanks so much yep. for walking us through this, brother. Um, and yeah, just thanks for having appreciate, me. Appreciate your ministry as well.